delivery or lines and that sort of thing, and then one gets past it right away because you know it's real. What he's feeling, the conflicts, the emotions that he's feeling, it's, it's really there. You know, probably the toughest two moments in the movie, not necessarily Harriet's um, desperate act at the end, which is luckily she's, she, she's okay, but there's two moments, and it has to do with the rivalry between Harriet and Valerie. The uh, sparring between the two girls forces Captain John to get up and throw rings. And somehow the way he was playing it had a truth to it that was very powerful, you know. And the moment where he slips and falls because he has one leg it was the most disturbing thing, the most upsetting moment um, uh, I'd seen in movies for a long, long time. And, of course, you're angry at the two girls for causing this, but on the other hand, you understand the tension. You could feel it. I couldn't describe it. I was uh, nine years old. I couldn't quite, but I understood the tension between the girls, and I understood the wanting uh, uh, to be favored by him and, and uh, who, who he's in love with, and that's all the fantasy. All of that coming on, I understood that, but the result was um, a humiliation for this man and also a brutal reminder that a part of him is missing, you know. And as you get older, you begin to learn more and more about that, and you feel more about that. But probably the toughest thing in the movie is... Um, uh, Valerie getting the kiss, I think, because um, Harriet says that was her first kiss, right? She loses the first kiss. You really feel it. Maybe not fully as a nine-year-old totally understanding the sexual context of it and all of that, but, you know, I just felt the hurt. You know, the film is very interesting because as it is like the river, the flowing, the endless flowing of life, uh, it has um, uh, simplicity and a beauty of everything that is in passing, everything that's like transitory. Everything's movement. Just life goes and then life, people die and then things come up again and life goes on. But also, um, there's very disturbing moments in it. And I felt this when I first saw the picture. Bogey playing with the snake. He was obsessed with snakes. A little boy, pure innocence, and the snake coming out of the tree, pure evil, in a sense, representing pure evil. I know there are many people out there who like snakes. I'm, it's fine with me. I personally have a little bit of a problem with it, but you know. When he's discovered dead, it's, it's really upsetting. I couldn't even imagine something happening like that to people. Somehow, along with the beauty that you see in the world around you in the river and the beauty of family life, there is that toughness and brutality in the picture, too, which I think uh, balances out just beautifully. Radha, who plays Melanie, who's a powerful beauty, hypnotic quality, the way she speaks and the way she moves, I mean, I've never seen anything of Indian culture up to that point. And I've got to understand, too, American audiences hadn't. Maybe in England they did, but we, ha we hadn't seen that. Melanie, she was half English, half Indian. Feeling her discomfort, feeling her confusion, there's something about her and her acceptance that you feel an emotional and dramatic resolve. You feel a sense of relief. We're talking about accepting the place in life where you are, which kind of flowers in a way when there's this dream scene about the Lord Shiva. This was something that was so foreign to me and so um, fascinating and I like the dancing and I love the music and how the dance sequence is edited within the film it's very advanced for the time even though it was pre uh, new wave it just didn't worry about time or space it just went the framing I think for the most part from head to toe seeing the dance and of course a Renoir didn't have the dolly track so uh, Radha had to come forward herself for a tighter shot and then move back. But it, 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 the limitations force him to certain decisions in, in, in the shooting of that dance sequence that uh, uh, makes it magical and special. Going back to Renoir's biography, he talked about wanting to make a film and uh, he read a review of the book by Roma Godden in New Yorker and went around uh, trying to pitch it with his agent in Hollywood. I never realized that until Peter Bogdanovich wrote about it. That Renoir, I never knew that he was out of fashion or couldn't get a job in Hollywood. You know, here he was trying to make a picture, India, you know, in color, and it would be, uh, uh, it'd be interesting, young girls coming of age, and we can get a good actress for it, we can get uh, uh, Marlon Brando he spoke to for playing uh, uh, Captain John, and, uh, you know, it, it just never happened. And he realized, you know, it wasn't going to get made and until Kenneth McEldowney, who was a florist, fell in love with it, and when he looked into who had the rights of the river, it was Renoir, so got together and financed the film, but ultimately, of course, they didn't have enough money to lure Hollywood stars. So, you know, in a way, what happened was that they made an experimental picture. I think it was his first really, <laughs> he felt, an experimental movie, in a way, for the commercial market. Kids can see it around the world, you know. For me, uh, it was an experience I had with my father in the movies. Somehow the emotions of the family and the love in that film, I felt 
let's say for him, and I couldn't express it, but the experience together was a loving experience seeing it. Then, in the late 50s, something unique happened in film history. A negative for Grand Illusion, long thought to be destroyed, or at least a dupe negative, was found. And the film was re-released as a, as a major release for foreign films. And I sort of became obsessed with that film. Uh, I must say, after seeing that film maybe 40 times or 50 times, I still find that I'd rather see The River, <laughs> you know, um, but there was something powerful about that movie. I don't want to get into that now, but it's Gabin and Freinet and von Stroheim and uh, the sublime sadness of it uh, is remarkable. Then I saw Le Regler de Jure, The Rules of the Game, which um, um, escaped me. Uh, I, I, it was very hard for me to get into the understand the culture of the servants and the uh, bourgeois in, in, in France. Uh, it was I enjoyed the movie, but I didn't quite go with its reputation as one of the greatest films ever made. I, I, I'm completely an outsider on that movie. I'm a, I have no understanding of the, of the culture and the world of that. And uh, but I think to the people in that world and all of Europe and all of what was happening between the two world wars, I think uh, you know it is a very very important movie. But uh, the body of work that I know as Renoir has inspired me. What I mean by that is, like, it doesn't inspire me to go make a film about uh, uh, Goodfellas in, in a bar in, in, in Queens and uh, guys being shot. It doesn't inspire me, certainly inspire me for that. But what it does and constantly does is to inspire me to get up and say, let's make films again. The purity of his work, the sense that he really understood the people that he was dealing with, and the sense that he kind of liked the people and liked the actors from what I could tell. That is something to always keep you going, that that's the well that doesn't dry up as the Renoir cinema.